Hi everyone, I'm Rose Martin and we are right around the corner at G.W. Carver Elementary School in Salem with a Newbery Award winning writer, author, illustrator, Cece Bell. Hi Cece. Hey, how are you? Oh, I'm absolutely wonderful. And you have some superpowers that we're going to talk about. But why did we pick? Why did you want to do the um, show right here today? Well, I went to school here from the second grade until the sixth grade, um, probably 1977 to about 1981 mm. or 82. And so um, this school features very prominently in um, my graphic novel, Memoir El Defe. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're here. So let's talk about your childhood a little bit, because what happened when you were four years old? Well, when I was four in 1975, I got really sick with meningitis and at the time we were living in Richmond, Virginia and um, I got really sick and I ended up in the hospital for a couple of weeks and sometime during that two week stay in the hospital I lost a lot of hearing, probably about 85 to 95 percent mm -hmm. of it and so um, it took a while for my parents to figure that out that I had lost so much hearing but when they did, they got me outfitted with hearing aids and um, that sort of was a big life-changing moment. Sure, because as a four-year-old, right. how do you communicate with your mom and dad that you're not really hearing them or even the nurses and doctors who are in the hospital, right? They, what happened was when I got home from the hospital, no one knew. I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. It was just sort of this new way of being and um, my mother didn't figure it out until I was looking for her in the house. I had gotten very clingy because you know I had some real fears after the hospital sure. that I wouldn't be separated from her forever and so um, I was looking for her and running around the house trying to find her and she was right behind me saying my name and I never turned around. And so she put it all together, and, um, and that's how they figured it out. Mm. So then what happened? After that, um, they took me to an audiologist, and I got outfitted for hearing aids. And um, they really helped a lot, but um, then and now, it's the sort of, um, it's not perfect. And so I can hear people... When they speak, I can hear the vowel sounds, but I can't hear the consonants. Hmm. So um, speech was tricky, but because I was already speaking, I had, that was okay. Right, because you had, you were hearing until four. Right, before, right. right. I heard just fine before. Mm -hmm. And so for kindergarten, I ended up in a school in Richmond that had a program, um, a class with other deaf kids like me, and we all wore some kind of hearing aid device. Mm -hmm. And we learned how to lip read, but we were discouraged from learning sign language. Hmm. So remember back then it was the 70s, sure. and they were really pushing the oral way. Mm -hmm. And I disagree with that now, because not every deaf person can lip read. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just, that's an assumption that a lot of people make. Even I made that assumption mm -hmm. for years. You know, this is great. It, but it's not perfect either. Mm -hmm. And looking back on it, I wish that I had the full, the full plate, mm -hmm. which is what a lot of schools today offer their deaf students, not just you know, oralism and lip reading, but also sign language. Mm -hmm. Because so you don't do your sign language. I don't language do sign point. language. Yeah. I never learned it. Mm -hmm. My whole life has been in the hearing community mm -hmm. and um, sort of not necessarily by choice, but just by circumstance. My mm -hmm. whole family can hear. It's just sort of, you know, mm -hmm. it's just sort of played out that way. And sign language is so complex sure. that learning it as an adult is just like, you know, <laughs> Right. So your parents then wanted you to live in the hearing world. They did. They did. And that was their world. That's what they mm -hmm. knew. Mm -hmm. And um, and I didn't. I was so really good at lip reading as a kid that um, it really wasn't so much an issue, mm -hmm. I don't think. So you go into elementary school, what's that like? Right, that was, it was okay for kindergarten because I had all these kids who were just like me. Mm -hmm. But then we moved away 
to Salem, where we're sitting right now, and um, for first grade, we were in a different school in Salem that eventually, an old building that eventually um, closed down because they switched the school system over. But um, that was really hard. I got a special hearing aid, which I brought to show oh, you. Oh, great. And um, it was called the Phonic Ear. It's featured very heavily in the book. And um, it's really not all that big, but I'll put it on so you can see kind of what it looks like. Um, it still fits me because um, I didn't grow much. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. So I strapped it on every day, and this was only used for school. Okay. And I had a different, smaller hearing aid for home, and these little earpieces would go in my ears like this. And even though I'm wearing it on the outside of my clothes, here, when I came to school, I always kept it covered. Always. A so, little self-conscious? Yeah. Yeah. Just, I was just so self-conscious sure. about it. And this worked together with a microphone that the teachers wore that amplified their voices, but just for me, because I was the only one wearing this. And um, this thing really helped and made all the difference for me. And I actually wore some version of this all the way through college. Hmm. And it just got smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. um, I wore this from about the first grade until the sixth grade, mm -hmm. and then they got smaller. And so the teachers would carry this around for, and then what happens would, when you they would, would switch classes? Their they would just, right. yeah, teachers would carry it around. Right. And so it didn't matter where they were in the classroom, you were able to hear everything. Right, as if they were speaking right in uh -huh. my ear, right directly in my ear. And, um, but I was very self-conscious about mm -hmm. this stuff. And um, something that I talk about with kids that I visit but is not in the book, is that because I kept it covered, the other kids wanted to know what was underneath my clothes. Sure. And instead of saying, oh, I'm, I'm deaf, this is a hearing aid, it helps me hear, I was too just self-conscious and baffled by everything mm -hmm. that I told them that I was pregnant. Oh. And I was going to have a baby. And so, In first grade. <laughs> yeah, right. And so since I wore this thing from the second grade to the, or the first grade to the sixth grade. I was pregnant for five oh. years. Good long time. <laughs> oh gosh. So, yeah. you know, when you were in elementary school then, it had to be hard just kind of negotiating the friendships and trying to figure out where you fit in. School's hard enough to begin with. Right. So you have mom and dad at home and siblings, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So what was that like? It was, it was tricky. Um, it's always been tricky, uh, but I think I was naturally attracted to people who didn't talk about it, who acted like it wasn't even there, that my hearing aids weren't there and it was no problem. And so, or the people that just, just kind of treated me like they treated everybody else. And sometimes that had good repercussions mm -hmm. and sometimes it didn't because the way they treated other people wasn't so great. Right, either, they weren't so know? nice. <laughs> right, right. right. So, um, and then, then is now, I'm always attracted to people who are a little on the um, rambunctious side, who speak clearly and are maybe demonstrative with their hands mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, but it was really were, hard at first. Were they different? Did they, after they found out that you learned differently, that the deafness was there, did people change or treat you differently? Definitely. Or slow down Sometimes, their language? Right, right. <laughs> yeah, that was a real problem. The, the people who would fixate it on it, some, some people are like, um, I'd like you to meet Cece. She's my deaf friend. Mm. And to make themselves look good. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, oh, you're deaf. Hello. Mm. How are you? You know, no. Just, or really loud. Yeah, like, really loud. As if loud, that's going to make a difference. And, you know, they're well-meaning. Sure. And it took me a long time to learn that they were just being well-meaning. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I would get quite frustrated and angry at, mm -hmm. at folks like that. Um, so I was just always attracted to the people that didn't make an issue of it. And sometimes, especially when you're a kid, those people are hard to find. And mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, so I was kind of shy. And, but once I get to know somebody, I'm extremely goofy mm -hmm. and silly. And you know, that feeling when you just click with somebody. Yes. Yay, yeah. you know. And the differences don't matter because we all have a difference. Right, right? exactly, yeah. exactly. And you know, that's something that you don't know as a kid. You think you're the only one, mm -hmm. but every single person has something going on mm -hmm. in their lives. And maybe you see it and maybe you don't. And um, those of us who feel like you, they can see it, that's just, ah, you know, yeah. don't look. <laughs> right. Yeah. So what do you like to do um, when you were a child and you'd get home and you could take off the phonic gear and you were just playing in the neighborhood? What are some of those things? Was illustrating or writing always a passion? Yeah, I did. Um, actually, I watched a lot of television. <laughs> that, that, ooh, I'm not proud of that. But um, when I got home, yeah, I would take it off and play with, it was a great neighborhood, um, very close by to where we are now, mm -hmm. and lots of kids, and so a lot of playing around, and um, I did draw a whole lot in my free time. I was very interesting, I mean, interested in drawing much more than writing. It was something that I felt confident about, and I felt good at it, and it was something that it didn't matter that I couldn't hear, because mm -hmm. it was all about you know, my eyes and my hands, and it was almost sort of like this secret communication that I had with the paper, you mm -hmm. know, just, it didn't matter sure, that I couldn't hear. Out. Right, yeah. yeah. So and I spent a lot of time drawing and, and watching TV. <laughs> and so now, being married, your husband is also in the literary world, writing and right. illustrating, and you do some of his books, right? I do, So I do. who's in charge when it comes to the story versus the illustration? I don't know. Um, How, what's that like? A little tricky? Well, I end up kind of being in charge. Okay. Because, um, you know, I made it very clear that he was not allowed to interfere with, um, with my illustration process, but I always get involved with his words. <laughs> and um, Tom is just, he's a hoot, but um, we disagree sometimes on, well, no, we don't disagree, but I would often find things in the story that I felt like, oh man, if you would just do this, bam, you know. Right. And he often takes my advice. He's better at taking my advice than I am taking, taking his. Taking his advice? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. a happy husband then, right? <laughs> to be able to do that. And how about your kids? Are either of them writers or illustrators? Um, or seeing that passion? Oh, yeah, it's developing. Yeah. It's developing. Yeah. yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. So what's it like in the daily life of C.C. Bell? What do you talk to me? I'm interested to see what you do. Okay. Well, I'm definitely a morning person. Okay. And ideally, an ideal day would be getting up around 5 and then um, going straight to work. Not even, you know, just going straight to work. And for, that means for me, I have a little studio that's right next to our house. That's one of those Home Depot barns. Oh, really? So, yeah, yeah, that I ended up getting finished on the inside. And to work, I really need to be away from the house and away from the distractions, mm -hmm. like, you know, the dishes that need to be done okay. and all that stuff. And it's my own little space. So I get up at 5, and then I try to do whatever project I'm currently working on. I try to focus on that for a couple of hours. And then I go back home and um, kind of get the family <laughs> risen <laughs> and right. out the door. And my kids go to school. And then, um, and then I go back to work. And I usually take a break. And I do, I try to get a big strenuous walk in every day because a lot of my ideas come to me um, during those walks. So it's good for me, but it also sort of, that's where almost all my ideas come from, and any time I'm stuck on a story, it, it all makes sense on that walk. And that's what I was going to ask yeah. you about. Where does that inspiration come from? So it's walking. It's walking. So it doesn't matter, rain, snow, sleet, you are out there walking right. and creating. Right. And mm. my husband, Tom, is the same way, and in fact, he will walk for miles and miles and miles and then come home and then just be like, you know, <laughs> it all comes out at once. And mine is a little different. We work very differently. But it's true that if there's like a part of the story that's not working, you just take that walk and you say, okay, on this walk, I'm going to solve this problem 
it almost always gets really? solved. Yeah, it's really mm -hmm. interesting how so, much that matters. So with that process, is it the story that then comes first before the illustration? For me it does okay. because I'm, I'm definitely not the greatest illustrator in the world and I'm well aware of that. Part of it is just laziness, you know, I just don't want to take the time sometimes mm -hmm. to really, and so I always focus on the story if I didn't, first I mean, if I was thinking about the illustrations then I might say, oh well this will be a book that doesn't have any cars or adults in it because I don't like to draw cars oh. or adults. Okay. <laughs> grown ups, grown ups are impossible to draw. Okay. So if I thought that way, then I yeah. would not be telling the stories I want to tell. Mm -hmm. So I think only of the story first and I try really hard to get it as good as I think it is at that, you know, I think this is perfect. But of course, when I start drawing, changes come up and there's a lot of back and forth, especially with picture books. Mm -hmm. You know, you start to see, oh, I can take entire sentences out and let the work, uh, pictures do the work, mm -hmm. or vice versa. So there's a lot of changes that come later, but I do try to get the story, the actual, the action of it. Maybe not, the, maybe the words aren't perfect yet, mm -hmm. but the actual, the structure of the story needs to be solid before I go any farther. So how long of a process is that? For example, in El Defo, because you did, a, it's beautiful as a graphic comic book novel. Mm -hmm. right. So it's attractive to all ages to pick it up and read it. Who might say, right. oh, I don't know, that looks like a lot of pages. Yeah, it's you a know? lot of pictures. So yeah. how, um, what was that process like and how long did that take? The whole process from start to finish um, probably took me about five years, mm. but maybe three of those years were um, other projects were going on too that I was finishing up and then the final two years of that five-year period were um, hardcore 40 hour a week kind of thing but um, that process was I spent a long time with this outline and the outline was just the, the book is very episodic in a mm -hmm. way and so each chunk of the outline was an episode about a paragraph long, but I spent forever on that cookie. I mean, I just yeah. hemmed and hawed over it, and then each paragraph was a chunk that became a chapter, and I arranged them certain ways to tell the best story, and then I got started. Mm. And um, It's so honest and so real. Why was it so important to write it? Oh gosh, there were lots of reasons, but um, the real trigger for me was around the time that I started working on it, I was about 40, and I sort of looked back at my life and I thought, you know, I have never been comfortable talking about my deafness. Why is that? And um, it's ridiculous. I mean, I wouldn't ask people to repeat themselves, mm -hmm. and I just couldn't say the words, I'm deaf. And it's really easy now, but only because I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. It was just sort of a way for me to get past that and to just force myself to be proud of the things I had done instead of ashamed of this thing that you don't even need to be ashamed of. Right. It's ridiculous to be ashamed of it. It just is. And so that was probably the main reason I wrote it. It's sort of like my calling card, mm -hmm. you know, this is me, yep. ta-da. And, um, and I also knew that a lot of the stories related to deafness were very funny, and I wanted to, to share this story with people that was not maudlin. There mm -hmm. were no violins in the background. Right. You know, it's funny, it's just... Yeah. It is what it is, you know. Well, and there's such real experiences, like the girlfriends that you have in this book. Are you still friends with any of them, by the way? Oh, definitely, okay. definitely. Um, my best friend in the book, Martha, uh -huh. we're still friends. And then um, some, not a few, not so much. Um, but um, Mike Miller, who was my crush, yeah. we reunited about three years ago for the first time in, I don't know, it had been 30 years. What did he think about being in the book? He loved it. He <laughs> loved it. He was really sweet about the whole thing. I think he's a little weirded out, yeah. you know, because of all this. Oh, I love you, And you're Mike. in elementary yeah. school. You're like, oh, yes, I'm in love with you. Yeah. You know, as a former teacher and principal, the fact that 
the they were wearing the um, what part? How did you what did you the call that, that part? Yeah, the the amplifier. Yeah, the fact that they could hear that you could hear them everywhere in everywhere. the school. So in the teacher's lounge, in the bathroom, as you talk about, yeah. in the cafeteria, it didn't matter where. I look, I read that part and I'm like, yikes. Yes. You know, as a former teacher principal, I'm like, I don't know if I would have been so happy with all that, but I've been a major right. popular with the kids. Huh? Yeah, yeah, it was great. I mean, it was, that was my superpower. Yeah, and yeah. I love the way you talk about superpowers and turning a difference into that special power that you have and that you can overcome anything. Right. Any advice for a younger CC now that you've oh my finished goodness. this? And totally, okay. totally. Uh, my main piece of advice for me would be, or maybe even a uh, reminder, kids love technology and they love it now, they loved it then. If I had just been upfront mm -hmm. and been like, you know, look at me, I've got technology, yeah. woo! <laughs> and um, it took a long time for me to share it. I wish I had shared it sooner, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Not been so secretive about myself. And that's what I tell kids when I go right. to school visits. It's so much better and more fun to um, share the things about you to make you different and unique than to keep them tucked away because um, those are the things that make you interesting. You know. That's an important lesson for kids and adults, right? Oh, Don't totally. Don't hide behind the things you're scared of or you think are a little weird or different. Right. But that's what makes you special. Yeah. And that's where your superpowers come from, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So has the process for you changed or evolved over the years with all of the books that you've written or any of the rest of them about your, your life or your friends? Um, the process has generally stayed the same, but I will say that um, doing a graphic novel as opposed to a picture book is a lot more organic mm -hmm. and it's a lot more, you just sort of, there's a lot more back and forth and it actually in some ways is easier for me and it, all it is is dialogue and you just sort of if you're somebody who talks to yourself anyway. Like most of us are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or just, you know, enjoys communication in any form, then it kind of flows naturally. In a picture book, you know, everything has to be so sure. a little more precise, rigid and yeah. precise. So um, that's just a big difference. But I generally have always worked the same way and overwork. I overwork mm. things and... Well, and that's why it's so good. So yeah. the dialogue is beautiful. Would you mind reading a passage? Would you pick oh, a passage sure, and read for sure. us? Sure, definitely. Okay. And so I'll set this up a little bit. Um, I'm talking about when I first um, get the phonic ear for the first time mm -hmm. and I first try it out and first realize what all it can do. And so since there are several different characters speaking, when it's me speaking or thinking, thinking to myself, I'll sort of raise my hand a little bit mm -hmm. just to make it a little okay. easier. And then there's sort of a narration that you'll be able to pick up on. So, summer ends. I find out that I will soon start first grade in a new school. Will I be in a class like Doran's class? No, sweetie. They don't have a class like that in your new school. But you'll be going to school with your new neighborhood friends. You're getting a brand new, super powerful, just for school hearing aid that will help you hear better. Is it smaller than this one? Well, it's bigger, but you'll hear so much more. And you can wear the little one at home. The neighborhood can? A bigger aid? Mom walks me to school on the first day. We've been here once before, and I already know where my classroom is, but I'm still scared. I wear my favorite striped shirt. And underneath that shirt, well hidden, I hope, is my brand new, super powerful, just for school hearing aid, a phonic ear. The phonic ear is paired with a microphone that my teacher, Mrs. Lufton, is supposed to wear. When Mrs. Lufton speaks into the microphone, it sends signals to the phonic ear. These signals end up sounding like Mrs. Lufton is talking right in my ear. Hello, welcome to the first grade. And I'm hearing, hello, welcome to the first grade. Mom was right. The phonic ear makes Mrs. Lufton's voice louder just for me. It even clarifies her voice, really sharpens it. Even when I don't see Mrs. Lufton's face, I understand every word she says without having to lip read at all. The phonic ear is really powerful. 
I can hear Mrs. Lufton wherever she is in the entire classroom, and I can totally understand her even if I can't see her. Mrs. Lufton is in the background saying, do you need to go to the bathroom? And I'm hearing, do you need to go to the bathroom? I soon discover that I can hear Mrs. Lufton wherever she is in the entire school building. I can hear her fussing at a classmate in the hallway right outside the classroom door. Jimmy, this is the third time this week. No more toys. The microphone even picks up other people's voices. I can hear Mrs. Lufton and the other teachers all the way in the teacher's lounge. That Jimmy Malone is making my life hell. My, my. <laughs> He'll be yours next year, Francis. She's that AC double hockey stick. Best or worst of all, I can even hear Mrs. Lufton when she uses the bathroom. Squeak! Zip! Tinkle, tinkle. Oh no! <laughs> ah, what a relief. Toilet paper? Wappa, 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 wappa. I know what's coming. Flush! Gee, what happened? Mm, nothing. That's incredible. I have amazing abilities unknown to anyone. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. And you have amazing superpowers. Yeah, well, thank thank you, you so much for sharing them with us. We're going to have to leave it right there. But uh, there's so much more to learn about you. I appreciate so much Cece Bell being with us and sharing El Defo, her Newbery Award winning book. And to our friends at GW Carver Elementary School right here in Salem, we appreciate your hospitality. Thank you. To all of you, we'll see you next time right around the corner.